Welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and we have four distinguished guests today for the sustainability panel. Uh, as you know, composites are materials which are built in order to last and to endure forever. And this brings a dilemma uh, because they are also hard to rec recycle. So, uh, in the recent years, there have been some uh, research in technology development to recycle all these uh, composite materials uh, in a, let's say, less energy consuming way and which is also economical. Uh, according to AUCR, 40 to 70 percent of the composite wastes are still ending in landfill, so that's a lot. And the rest, most of the rest, is still being burned. That's also a lot. Uh, this means a majority of the composite waste uh, is uh, not being reused or recycled or uh, converted back to its uh, in initial uh, properties. The composite business uh, in 2021 is approximately 37 billion uh, US dollars, uh, which is also 12 million tons. And uh, this business grows uh, by 55% in every year, and this is expected to continue till 2026. And the uh, uh, increase rate is uh, expected to increase uh, due to the Green Deal and all these uh, deals which are happening, uh, which are going to increase the use of green energy. Uh, transportation uh, vehicles will also be built more out of composites because they are lighter. So even though we don't have much uh, composite weight, waste nowadays, even though we are not uh, talking about it so much uh, nowadays, we will have to, we'll end up talking about it a lot. And that's why we are trying to find some solutions about it uh, today, so it will be not late uh, tomorrow. New uh, materials, new production methods, and new applications are being sold. And today's speakers uh, will talk about them. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Douglas J. Gardner from, uh, from the University of Maine. He is a professor and program leader of sustainable materials and technology in the School of Forest Resources at the University of Maine. And he is also a member of the Advanced Structures and Composite Center and Forest Bioproducts Research Institute. Uh, he has a very long biography. I'm not going to read everything. I'm sh I would like to leave some time uh, to him to explain his presentation. And uh, the top, his presentation will be about sustainability in the wood products, building materials sector. So he will talk about, uh, about sustainability, the LCL tools to study sustainability, the examples of sustainable wood-based sustainable wood materials and their use in construction. Please, uh, Professor Gardner. A um, little bit about uh, you know, where I am at the University of Maine. Um, I'm part of the uh, Advanced Structures and Composite Center and uh, basically we focus on uh, research, education and economic development. And that encompasses uh, material science, manufacturing, engineering of composites and structures. The, the background picture on the slide is basically our center, which is about uh, 100,000 square feet um, of uh, you know, laboratory and office uh, space. One of the big projects, and I'll talk more about this um, at the end of my presentation, is uh, we're doing a lot of work uh, currently in large-scale bio-based additive manufacturing. Um, we currently house the, the world's largest 3D printer, um, and uh, you can see a picture of it there. Um, and we're doing a lot of work, uh, you know, looking at um, bio-based composites uh, materials for different types of applications 
you know, including building materials and tooling and things like that. But I'll get back, I'll get back more into that later on. Um, so today, my presentation will be talking about some of the, the basic aspects, uh, kind of set the stage for sustainability, um, the circular bioeconomy and carbon economy. I'll talk about some of the tools to study sustainability. Um, and the big ones are life cycle assessment and life cycle inventory. Um, and then I'll talk about sustainability in the, my area, which is uh, wood-based building materials. Um, and then talk about some of the current research topics relative to wood-based materials. And then I'll talk about one of our big research programs um, that uh, we're partnering with Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, looking at sustainable manufacturing using forest-based uh, materials. So when we talk about sustainability, uh, most, most of us, you know, probably first think of the environmental aspects of, uh, you know, looking at materials, you know, where are we gonna get the, the, the feedstocks for our materials? But sustainability is more wide ranging because it impacts um, a lot of different aspects of life. Um, it, it, it's, it, it affects society, um, it affects business, um, economics. Um, and uh, I like this quote that it's from the US Environmental Protection Agency to pursue sustainability is to create and maintain the conditions under which humans and nature can exist in productive harmony to support present and future generations. Um, and that's a nice succinct um, uh, description of, of what sustainability is. One of the big things of looking at sustainability is um, we kind of need to, to, to to change our paradigm on how we look at economics. Um, I show you on the, the left side of the screen, the typical uh, linear economic model that you know, we followed uh, pretty much for the past uh, several centuries um, in uh, um, you know, developing materials and, and use of materials and those sorts of things. We typically take materials, whatever our feedstocks might be, then we make something, then we use something, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time, and then we dispose of that, and that potentially can lead to pollution and ca causes uh, some of the problems that, that we see uh, with, with the, the linear economic model. Within the, the aspect of circular econ bioeconomy, um, we basically change the way we look at things and, and we basically try to use whatever resources that we have to the maximum. Um, we may reuse those resources at the end of its life. We try to reduce waste in whatever that we do um, and, uh, and, and then hopefully maintain things as long as possible. So it's a, it's a, it's a different way of looking at things. Now for the circular economy, there's key principles. First one, let's, let's, get, let's design our materials so we get rid of as much waste as possible. And then we design for circularity. And what does that mean? We're gonna, you know, hopefully at the end of life, um, reuse or recycle whatever we're making, you know, and reuse, maybe, maybe repurpose it. Um, we have a variety of uses that potentially can be used and we might have multiple surface lives instead of a single surface life, we might have um, you know, two or three depending on things. And then we have a hierarchy of value retention processes. We might, we might have direct reuse. We may have to repair, we may have to refurbish or remanufacture. And then hopefully we're gonna preserve the natural capital of whatever our inputs are in, into, um, you know, whatever material that we're making. Relative to wood products, um, we actually um, have 
a triumvirate of, uh, of, of areas that we, we worry about. We have the circular economy, we have the bio economy, and then we actually have the circular carbon economy. Um, and again, I, I've kind of talked a little bit about the circular economy and, and the bio economy. I haven't talked so much about the circular carbon economy, but um, a lot of a lot of what we do, um, carbon is really important, right? Um, in, in in you know in life, you know, and it also causes problems. Um, so you know, we want to understand you know how carbon it might be sequestered uh, in in our products, and uh, you know how that can contribute to pollution you know, the CO2 and the atmosphere and all that. So that's one of the things that's been focused on over the past two decades relative to wood products. So a few terms, we have um, carbon sequestration and that's the process involved in capturing carbon and long-form storage of atmospheric carbon dioxide or other forms of carbon to mitigate or defer global warming. Um, that's one area in wood products where we, we do a good job because when you grow trees where we get wood, we store carbon dioxide for a long time, depending on the use. Um, another thing that we typically worry about in materials is the embodied carbon. What, and basically what we call the carbon footprint of a material because any manufacturing process to make any type of material is going to have a carbon footprint because usually you use fuel um, or polymers or whatever to make a material. So there's embodied carbon is another important thing. Um, I want to mention uh, where I got some of the information there. There's been a consortium for research on renewable and industrial materials called Quorum. Um, and this has been around now for um, almost 50 years. Um, and basically, they look, look at the um, environmental performance of wood building materials. Um, and it go, again, it goes back into the 1970s. Um, but a phase two of the quorum group started uh, about a decade ago um, in trying to update um, how um, wood based materials uh, contribute to a you know, sustainable uh, future for things. Um, the other um, thing, again, is that's important as if you're going to study sustainability, you need to have tools. And, and the two big things that we typically look at are life cycle inventory and life cycle assessment. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a couple minutes. So um, this was a this was a, a uh, um, slide that I got. This came out of uh, um, something from the UK, but I really liked it. Um, it's a it, it's a guide specifically to to timber or wood in the circular economy, and uh, and it very simply talks about the um, wood as a material, uh, the the circular economy principles, um, a little bit about renew renewability and reusability. Um, and uh, design guidelines and uh, talks a little bit about cradle to cradle, um, you know, and, uh, and then, then actually providing a life cycle database. And I thought this was really, really, really kind of nice. It's fairly new. It's, it's only been out for uh, a couple of years. Um, Well, one of the things um, within sustainability, uh, at least, you know, in, in the wood area, and, it's, and it also, um, you know, is important to any other area, if you're going to look at sustainability, is trying to minimize harm, you know, within the environment, but also maximize value, because you're not going to do something in, in the materials area, unless you can make money at it. it you know, it's one thing to try to you know, you know, do something sustainably, but if you can't do it sustainably in an economics uh, standpoint, it's not going to be good. So typically the things that we do at the end of life is, are we going to reuse materials? 
in that that case, reuse you, you design for reuse, so you can actually you know take something apart and and and, and, and reuse it again. But you may actually have to repair that material. Um, you may have to refurbish, um, remanufacture, um, and then um, that way you can minimize harm. And similarly, these things that you do to minimize harm can also max maximize value. Um, where instead of throwing things in the you know in the landfill or the dump, you can actually have a feedstock that actually will have some economic value. So that th those are important aspects of sustainability. We don't do just sustainability for sustainability's sake, but we do it because it, it makes sense and then, and then we can also make money doing it. Well, one of the interesting things about sustainability in forest products is um, and this is something that we've been doing probably now for the past 30 years, 20 or 30 years, is where do we get the wood? How do we get the wood? Well, uh, in a lot of cases, wood comes from forest lands. Are these forest lands um, privately owned? Are they publicly owned? Um, can you trace where the tree came from? Was it obtained legally? You know, th these are all these are all sorts of things that are important. Was the the, the company that um, grew the trees following sustainable forest management practices? These are all important things. Um, how does it impact the climate? Pollution. Um, these are all important important things in, in sustainable forest products. And a lot of times, if we're gonna make a composite, do we need to use a tree or can we use recycled fiber to make whatever product? These are things that are important, um, it, you know, in, in, in you know, sustainable procurement of forest products. Okay, life cycle assessment. Again, this is the big tool. Anytime that we're gonna look at sustainability, we need to understand the process. This is sort of the in, this is sort of the engineering aspect of things, getting down into the weeds of what we do. So basically, LCA quantifies the inputs that go and the outputs. So we look at waste, wastewater, solids of a product system, and then ev evaluate the environmental impacts from each life cycle stage. Um, LCA is the prime tool to measure sustainability. Um, some things you'll hear about when you do LCA, um, are you doing cradle to grave? Cradle to grave is the linear bio, the, the linear economy that we talked about earlier. Or are we doing cradle to grade, cradle where we're doing a circular economy? So it's important to understand how you're getting your raw materials, how you're processing, consuming, transporting the final product and how they're analyzed. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with uh, ISO, the International Organization for Standardization. Um, and ISO basically has two standards that are um, part, part of the, you know, the, the global life cycle assessment. Um, and then you have to actually have the tools to do LCA. And, 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 the, and basically the tools are, are, are software. And the software can either be open source software or you can actually purchase um, specific software licenses. And I, I give an example of SEMA Pro. Um, and uh, SEMA Pro, you know, a lot of the open source might be free SEMA Pro, if you get a SEMA Pro license, it, it is an expensive software, but you get a database and you get an updated database and the database is as, as important to the inputs into the, into the software to do the LCA as the actual software itself. So database access, timeliness is really important in life cycle assessment.
So here's a, um, a typical life cycle of a wood product that's used in a building material. Um, and you have to grow your tree that anywhere that could be anywhere from say 25 to 60 years, depending on where you are on, uh, on the planet. Um, within a year or less, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to cut down that tree and then you're going to process it into a pr process. If you're going to go into a building material, typically you're going to build a house, you're going to build um, a, a, a larger type structure, commercial structure, and hopefully that, 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 uh, that structure is going to last for anywhere from say 30 to 150 years. And then at the end of its life, um, then that's going to be broke down where it may be, you know, reused or remanufactured. Some of it may end up going to the landfill, um, but that typically happy, happens fairly quickly. And then you, then you have to follow all these things to try to figure out what, you know, what energy goes in, uh, in, in terms of making it. So if you're a company, how do you how do you go to sustainability? You know what what how do you implement a framework? Um, well, you need to look at your existing products and how you make that, and then you determine well, are there sustainable replacements? Can we get the same properties, the same functionality? Import, more importantly, can we do it at a similar cost? Right. Um, and then, then we look at the, 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 you know, the raw materials that go in, can, you know, can we do that? Can we do, you know, can we go from, you know, a non-sustainable raw material to a sustainable raw material? What about transportation? You know, um, how far, you know, how far do I have to transport, um, you know, a, a sustainable alternative because transportation can get real expensive and there can be a lot of carbon emissions. So that's an important aspect of how you do things. And then the processing, is the processing going to be similar? Is it going to be less, you know, less expensive or more, more sustainable? These things you have to worry about. Then the use, is the use going to be the similar to the, 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 um, uh, the you know fossil based um, type of material, and then what's the end of life? You know, is it, can we reuse it? Um, you know, can we recycle it? You know, can it be biodegraded? These are things that we need to we need to think about as we implement going from you know, going from non sustainable to sustainable materials. And this is what companies are are, are doing a lot these days. Okay, I'm going to jump a little bit now as I've kind of provided the background for, you know, sustainability and talk a little bit more specifically about wood-based composites. Now, in wood-based composites, of course, you have wood in various different forms that um, are part of the composite, but then you also have polymers um, and, and, and typically these may be adhesives or matrix materials, and they're going to come. And if we're going to go sustainable, they're typically going to be they're going to come from biopolymers. And examples of biopolymers are proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and oils. Um, also, there can be adhesives that you can actually get from renewable resources, be they lignin. Lignin is part of. Uh, uh, the, the chemistry um, of, a, of a tree. Tannins are also uh, um, chemicals, byproducts from, uh, that can be processed from trees. And then you have things um, like polylactic acid, which is a biopolymer that actually comes from a carbohydrate. Right now, um, it's commercialized. It actually comes from starch. Um, and at least in the U.S., a lot of it comes from corn. But any source of starch can be used um, for, um, you know, making the, the, the biocomposites. Um, th this is a little bit deeper dive into various routes to make polymers from fossil-based or bio-based um, resources. 
So if you're non-sustainable, you're going to use oil, an oil refinery to make your polymers. If you're going to be sustainable, you're going to use a bio refinery where you're going to take, you know, um, you know, uh, trees and plant-based materials to make similar polymers that you would make from oil. So, and, and they, and these potentially can be used in the composite applications. Um, so in some cases, yeah, we might use oil. Um, in other cases, we might use polysaccharides or <clears throat> other extractive materials to make our polymers. Well, adhesives are always a big part of wood-based composites. And up to 100, about 100 years ago, most of our wood-based composites use biopolymers. They'd been, they'd been used for thousands of years in making wood composites. I, I have a table here that lists some of the different types of applications of bio-based polymers going back thousands of years. It was really quite interesting that even Neanderthals, um, uh, prior to modern man, uh, actually were using bitumen 40,000 years ago um, to, to, you know, to glue their arrow points onto a, onto a shaft. So we know, we know, you know, we know how to use biopolymers as adhesives. And, uh, and, and, and again, we can go back to using these because, you know, we've done it for a long time. So it's not, it's not unusual since, since we've been doing it. Okay, um, one of the probably most interesting um, wood-based products over the past couple decades is something that's referred to mass timber. And mass timber is a um, basically a timber composite, and there's a number of different types that, that can go into building large structures. I show a picture um, of um, a dormitory at the University of British Columbia that is made of cross laminated timber. That is a 20 story building made out of wood. Um, some of the other types of mass timbers, you've got mass plywood panels, you've got structural composite lumber, glue lamb timbers, all of these things can be used in this type of application. Now, what, what caused the ability to go to making larger structures like I just showed you? Well, a big part of building with timber is building codes. Um, anytime you build with timber, you have building codes, especially say in North America or even in Europe, that you have to be able to handle um, and one of the big things is, is, is fire, right? And historically, anytime you built with timber frame construction, you were limited to about four or five stories. I got a picture here um, of a um, residential um, apartment complex that's, that, that's having a terrible fire. One, two, three, four, it's four stories. Why is that? Well, most fire trucks can only go up to that high. They only have ladders that can go that high to, to fight the fire. So it's all about fire codes. With mass timber, all of a sudden, we can change the paradigm of building where we can build 9, 12, 18 stories, depending on construction. Fire protection is built in to the actual composite, and everything is really important. And again, marrying wood timber with different types of structural materials where you have non-flammable materials with the wood enables us to go to these larger scale construction. And thus um, the use of timber um, becomes um, something that uh, provides a sustainable future for you know, tall buildings. Another area um, of using wood um, is in the insulation um, uh, uh, of, of buildings where you can make buildings and keep them warmer um, and uh, provide you know, 
building envelopes, thermal acoustic solutions, and everything you know is uh, is sustainable. And the and the big competition for wood insulation is fiberglass, rock wool, polymer foams, all all typically non-sustainable. And uh, and and I think this is going to be um, a big. Uh, it's already starting. It's already been being produced in Europe, um, and there's a plant being built right now uh, here in the state of Maine in the U.S. And I think this is going to be really something to, to watch over the next couple decades um, in moving away from the non-sustainable uh, um, alternatives for insulation. Um, an interesting example um, that there was a company, Columbia Forest Products. They and, and, and they were an early adopter of going to sustainable bio-based materials, um, and and this is they've been doing it now for probably uh, fifteen years or so. They got away from using, um, you know, urea formaldehyde-based um, adhesives, and they actually went to using soybean protein adhesive that's formaldehyde free and they change their entire company. You know, they make particle board, they make plywood, they make fiber board and they made a decision as a, co a company to basically go completely sustainable. And, and, and this was again 15 years ago, they won a big award from, uh, from the Environmental Protection Agency. So it can be done. It can be done, you know, to go from a non-sustainable adhesive system to a sustainable adhesive system. Now I'm going to jump a little bit into some, some you know, something that's not commercialized, but, but some research that's going on. And this is some things that we're doing at the University of Maine, where we're actually um, taking cellulose and nanofibers um, you know, that we, you can make from wood and then, and then using those as a binder and particle board and, uh, and, and basically relying on the, the, the you know, the, 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 the inherent chemistry, the hydrogen bonding that's, that's available in cellulose and, and, and making a composite. So we can take this nanocellulose slurry that we make um, mechanically and then we can... Uh, basically mix it with uh, the wood furnish, you know, particle board furnish. We can make, we can make a panel, uh, put it in an oven, and then we get, and then we get a composite. We, we've actually done this on a, a commercial, uh, at least a commercial scale uh, press in our laboratory. And the, the proof of it is we can basically obtain mechanical properties that are similar to the commercial based materials. And, and here's a low density, um, low density particle board here, 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 and then this would be a medium density. So we fall within a low density and medium density commercial particle board um, for, you know, MOR, MOE, and, and an internal bond strength. So it's something that can be done. Uh, this is something that we, that we've been working on a completely sustainable composite. No, you know, no formaldehyde, formaldehyde free, uh, uh, bonding. So that's, that's another thing that can be done. Um, there's a lot of interesting things going on when I was putting this talk together. Um, I found uh, a, a few really uh, very interesting things. Here is a company, I believe this is in France, that they're making translucent touch sensitive wood. Can you, can you imagine that? Um, and then uh, 3D printing customizable uh, construction materials. Uh, it's very decorative uh, type of thing. So th these are some of the some of the interesting uh, things that are going on in the in, you know in the wood products area. Here's another one that's that's also uh, quite interesting, where basically making transparent wood. So you can take wood and 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 chemically remove some of the some of the 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 uh, lignin from the wood. Use epoxy to impregnate that delignified wood, and look what you can make. You can make a transparent. You can almost make a glass or, or, or a fenestration type material that could potentially change how 
Uh, you know, you do construction, right? You can make sustainable windows. Um, so that I think that's that, that's a quite interesting thing. Okay, so finally, I want to talk a little bit about this research program that we have right now. For interrupting and freezing you. No, that's all. That's that, that. That's no problem. I I'm sorry. I got I got a little long winded, but that's 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 the the, the professor in me. <laughs> okay. uh, I have a very short question. You already told us that you you've chosen uh, Simo Pro because it is a very nice database. Did you consider yep. any other uh, LCA tool? Any what? Any other LCA tool? Tool other than? Uh, yeah, LCA. I mean, personally. Um, uh, we use like in some work that I've done, I use SEMA Pro basically because of the database. Um, I know some of my faculty colleagues have used some open source so um, software and, and, and those work fairly well. But again, the database is really key. It's key. You, you, you need to have updated data on any manufacturing process and it, and it just makes life easy. And, you know, it, as a tool, yeah, you may have to spend five or six thousand dollars, say, for a license for SEMA Pro, but that's that's a minor minor thing, depending on the type of you know the type of work that you might be doing. Um, so, yeah, but if you have a good database, the open source LCA is is fine. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, nice presentation. Thank thank you. Thank you. Uh,